Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the biggest keys to understanding the Bible and getting the most out of Bible study is the realization that people haven't changed all that much since Bible times. What we often think of as mere biblical stories are actually the recorded histories of real people living very real lives. They had their own families, their own jobs, their own hopes and dreams. And as the scriptures often record for us in unwavering detail, they also had their own sins and character flaws as well. What we often see as only names on a page or perhaps images in a Sunday school lesson were actually real people living in a very real world. Today we get a glimpse into that world in our gospel reading when Jesus refers to two local events that we don't really have any other historical record for, but were obviously well-known events to the people that he was talking to that day. The first of these is the tragedy of a tower in Siloam falling on and killing a number of people. And the second is the atrocity of Pontius Pilate slaughtering some Galileans. These events were apparently the talk of the town, but when the people come to ask Jesus about them, Jesus flips the focus back on to the people who were listening. Do you imagine that these people were worse sinners because these things happened to them, he asked. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. You see, the people thought that these victims had done something wrong to earn their unlucky fate that their deaths were some sort of divine punishment for something they had done, that God was displeased with them in some way, and so God let these tragedies happen, and they wanted Jesus to tell them just what their sin might have been. We too can get lost in this kind of thinking. Sometimes we are indeed reaping the consequences of our own sinful actions and foolish decisions, but at other times we imagine that God is some sort of karma bank, where if we put good things in, then we should get good things out. And if we put bad things in, well then, what goes around comes around. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't speak this way, especially about those who are redeemed by Christ Jesus. Instead, the scriptures say of us, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you see, God is looking out for your good all the time. And so his care and his blessings are not driven by our good or our evil deeds. The real place where we discover that we are pretty much the same as the people living back then talking to Jesus that day is in how Jesus corrects their thinking, how he corrects our thinking. Jesus calls the crowd in front of him to repent, lest they too likewise perish, just like those that the people assumed were such evil and worse sinners than they were. In this way, Jesus takes everyone listening, and everyone reading after them, puts them into the same handbasket, the one that's headed to Hades. When we look at other people, the truth is that we always have a tendency to compare ourselves to them. Such an evaluation of our neighbor starts pretty early on, when we discover that our neighboring toddler has a toy that we want, and so we take it. School-age children discover that the world is quickly divided into the haves and the have-nots. Our teenagers know intrinsically that there are things that you need to have, things that you need to wear, things that you need to talk about and have the right opinions about in order to be socially acceptable to others around you. When we get into our 20s and 30s, it is materialism that sets in as we contemplate our careers and our promotions and we buy homes and cars and then stuff to fill those homes and cars. And it always seems like we have an eye towards our neighbor and what he or she has and perhaps what we do not. In middle age, we begin to think about our legacy and our accomplishments. We ask ourselves, have we been as successful as those people we graduated high school with? Have we traveled the world enough? 
Have we saved enough money for retirement? Have we made a difference out there in the world? Along with that, vanity rears up stronger than ever before as we continually try to recapture our youth and look down at growing older. But in those years that follow, we begin to start living vicariously through our children and our grandchildren, imagining somehow that bragging has now become a virtue and that permissiveness is what makes a happy family. We believe that our own opinions are true wisdom and our legacies are what matter, that we need our name on things lest we be forgotten. We need to leave something for our children lest they wind up destitute. It seems that all through life, we are driven by our comparison to others. If not in what we have, then certainly in what we do. Christians are, of course, taught to decry materialism. But Christians also have a tendency to always think of sin in terms of this one is a little bit less worse than that one. That there are sins and then there are really bad sins. That there are white lies, and then there are great deceptions. That there are sins of weakness, and then there are sins of wickedness. And we imagine that God makes such distinctions as well. That there are people who are, well, pretty good, but mess up from time to time. And then there are the truly evil sinners. But Jesus levels all of it. He doesn't make such distinctions. Instead, he says to each and every one, unless you repent, you will likewise perish, just like those people who were crushed by that tower, just like those people murdered by Pilate. But how do we repent rightly of something that has become so familiar and common to us that we hardly realize that we're comparing ourselves and thinking of ourselves as least less worse sinners than our neighbor. We don't even realize that we do it half the time. How can we ever make up for a lifetime of looking down on our neighbor and being selfish without even seeing it but in hindsight? It is, as we've been saying in our Lenten midweek confessions, some of my sin I know the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed, but some, O oh God, is known only to you. How can then we repent as Jesus commands? How can we ever be saved from an extent of sin that we barely even know and certainly could never list in entirety? Well, enter in the fig tree. Seriously, look at our text for today. After calling all those people to repent of their sins and warning them of the coming judgment if they don't, Jesus then tells this short, strange little parable of a fig tree. A tree that's barren for the three years the master has looked for fruit upon it and now he wants to cut down. But then the vine dresser, the gardener, pleads for one more year of mercy, one more year where that vine dresser will tend and water and fertilize and care for that tree in the hope that it will produce good fruit and be saved. Well, it's no mystery that you can imagine that the fig tree in question is actually indicative of us. Fig trees in the Bible are symbolic of the fruitfulness and prosperity of God's people. And a barren one in Israel was actually considered an affront to God himself. Just in the same way, we Christians are called to produce the fruits of righteousness and faithfulness. And yet, often when God looks for good fruit from us, he doesn't find very much. Or what he does find is rotten and wicked. But here's the interesting thing about fig trees. All fruit trees planted in Israel came with special conditions and instructions from God. If you go back all the way to Leviticus chapter 19, you'll find that for the first three years of a fruit tree's life, no fruit was to be harvested from the tree. This was to remind God's people about God's law and his commandments. 
His commandment especially to Adam and Eve about eating from all the trees in the garden except for the one that God forbade. A reminder that we are sinful, and even that commandment could not be followed. So for the first three years, the tree kept all its fruit. The fourth year, the fruit was harvested, but it was given as a gift to God. The whole year, all the fruit was an offering to God. It's only in the fifth year that the owner of a tree could begin to harvest the fruit for himself. Now the owner in our parable says that he's been seeking fruit from this fig tree for three whole years, which means that this tree is now in its seventh year of life, which is fitting as we understand that anything that with the number seven in the Bible has to do with belonging to God and his work. God comes, seeks fruit, finds none, and so he rightly condemns this tree. He rightly condemns us. But then the vine dresser comes in and pleads for an eighth year in order to do his work and make the tree fruitful again. Now this is ridiculous to any true gardener. Any gardener knows that a tree that hasn't produced any fruit for the last seven years isn't very likely to all of a sudden miraculously produce good fruit in an eighth. But remember, we're not really talking about trees here. We're talking about Jesus, and we're talking about us. This parabolic tree is in its eighth year of life, and that is significant because anything dealing with the number eight in the Bible has to deal with God's eternal redemption, God's promises, God's life. It's the reason why Jesus and every other Jewish male is circumcised and named on the eighth day of his life. It's also why many of the biblical miracles that are recorded for us happen on the eighth day. In this case, the work of the vine dresser to tend, to fertilize, and cultivate that fig tree is actually a reference to Jesus' work of redemption, a work that Jesus does in all eternity. What it means is that Jesus will water this tree with his baptism. Jesus will feed this tree with his body and blood. Jesus will shine upon this tree the light of his holy word, and such a tree will be saved. Dear friends, you are that tree. No matter what you've done or left undone in your life past, Jesus tends to you now. The sins of your youth, your selfish acts, your pride, your arrogance, your gossip, your doubt, Jesus has dug up all of it and buried it in his tomb. He has drenched it with the regenerative and life-giving water of his holy baptism so that it drowns and dies and is washed away. He has fertilized it with bread and wine in order to reverse the barrenness of the past and produce the good fruit that the Heavenly Father is indeed looking for. But you might say, it's well and good, but I still don't have enough. It's great that Jesus gives me a clean slate and a second chance at life. But when I look at my life, I realize I still don't have enough good fruit from my branches. Despite all the good things I might do, I still sin. I, I still do that which was wicked that I did before. Well, if that's the case, have no fear. For Christ is not a halfway savior. Everything that God requires of us, Jesus does. Everything that one needs in order to be saved, Jesus gives. It was not enough that Jesus should come down to earth just to keep the commandments of our God. No, Jesus also does all the good works of faith. All the fruits of righteousness, Jesus does himself all so that he can then come and hang them on your branches. But not like some dopey Christmas ornament hung in a dead apple tree. No, Jesus actually gives these fruits to you to claim as your own. It's as if he grafts them into us so that we are producing them, 
so that when the owner, the Almighty and Judge Eternal, comes to finally decide our fate at the end of time, he sees the required fruit in abundance and he pronounces our salvation secure. All of it, of course, belongs to Jesus, but he gives it to us because of his love and his grace and his mercy. Comparing ourselves to others will always be pointless. Jesus is as much for us as he is for them. And all the things of this world and life will perish and pass away. Only Jesus shall remain. Thanks be to God, then, that his gifts are not dependent upon our deeds, but rather rely only upon his promises and the love of Christ Jesus our Lord, who gave himself up for us, so that we would be saved. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only hope in this life and the next. Amen.